All right, welcome again, guys, to G Squared Academy, where you know excellence is as usually epitomized. Um, as you can see on your screen there, um, I'm going to be looking at paper three, um, CSEC chemistry paper three. This is January 2005. Some people might wonder why I go back this far, but you know, CXC will just pull questions from anywhere, really. So what I want to do today for you is discuss question one of this paper. And question one is pretty huge. It's, it's 20 marks. That's a lot of marks right there. So I want to just discuss with you um, question one and how you should approach this question um, when you're trying to do this paper. And I will be doing more paper threes because of COVID, you know, people are not able anymore to do labs as readily as before. So more people will have to be doing paper threes and you want to be prepared for that. And I really want you guys to pass your exam. So, and so I'll be doing more of these papers. So let's look at what's happening here now. It says the apparatus shown in figure one represents two experiments, A and B, conducted by a student in the laboratory. For an experiment A, you have a wash glass, your test tube, you have a mixture of iodine and sodium chloride, and you have bunsen burners right there. In experiment B, you have a solution of salt in water, and you have ice and ice cold water. All right. So um, that's the setup of your apparatus. What they're requiring you to do now, and as I said before, that doing a paper three really, your examiner is asking you to know as much as your teacher does it is very difficult you have to know a lot of chemistry you have to know a lot of science but this is what they're asking you to do okay so you have to be very prepared for this they ask you first of all to describe the observations that the student would have made in carrying out experiments a and b and indicate the changes of state that take place this is six marks six marks is a lot of marks so let's look at it and just go through Observations made, let's look at experiment one. Look at experiment one. In experiment one, you are, or investigation one, you are heating a mixture of iodine and sodium chloride. See right there? You're heating a mixture of iodine and sodium chloride right there. So um, what would you observe? Now you would have to remember that iodine is actually, um, a low melting point solid and it actually sublimes it actually sublimes so when you apply heat to it it will sublime and then you need to remember now what color iodine is iodine is actually a dark gray purple solid um at room temperature but then when you apply heat it sublimes and therefore if you are going to observe right here um purple vapor you're gonna see purple vapor in the test tube and then you're gonna start seeing some dark gray deposits on the underside of the wash glass. So that is what you would observe in experiment um, number one. But let's go back down a little bit. It says, indicate the changes of state. Okay, so let's indicate the change of state here. So let's go back up. And because iodine sublimes, the change of state would be from a solid to a gas. So the change of state solid to gas and you see purple vapor and little solid gray purple deposits on the underside of the wash glass here. Okay, so that is what you would observe in this experiment. Sodium chloride being table salt has an extremely high melting point. So nothing really would occur with that. Um, it would not melt either. It would take some time for it to melt, um, but yeah, it, chances are it would not melt unless it's there for an extremely long time. Okay, so the iodine would sublime. All right, so let's look at experiment two now. So in experiment two or experiment B, same thing again, they say describe the observations that the student would make and indicate any changes of state. So you're heating a solution of salt and water. Now the Bunsen burner, of course, um, would apply the heat to the test tube or this um, glass tube here, and the water would vaporize, okay? So it would start to boil eventually. And so the vapor would travel up this container into this tube and down this tube, okay? Then it would enter the ice and the ice cold water. 
um, they have these lines here, but they really are not in the tube. They're outside of the tube, okay? And so what you'd have there now is um, the vapor is going to condense because it's now being subjected to cold temperatures. So it's gonna condense. And then what you're gonna see down here is liquid um, water or it should be pure water really. So you see pure water down here. And that's what you would observe. Of course, some vapor would escape, um, but most of it would be cooled down into a liquid. So that is what you would, you're expecting to see there. That's what you expect to see. You're expecting to see vapor travel through here and then liquid um, water down here. So what's the change of state of matter? Well, first of all, the water um, boils. So that is from a liquid to a gas. And then you're going to change from a gas to a liquid when it gets down here. So condensation is going to occur and boiling evaporation will occur over here. All right. So that should give you your six marks. You would have explained every observation there and you would have given the changes of states of matter there. OK, there's one thing, though, over here, the um, the change of state would be from a gas to a solid. Um, because what you'd observe with the iodine over here is that the iodine would vaporize, not vaporize, sublime rather, sublime. And then what would happen is that the, the sublimed vapor would then cool down on the surface of the wash glass and deposit. We call it vapor deposition on the under surface of the watch glass. So first you have sublimation, solid to gas, and then you have gas to solid up here. So you can add that an, as an additional observation in terms of change of state for that question. All right. So that's that so far. Let's look at A2. It says explain the changes in the in state in experiments A and B in terms of the energy changes and the intermolecular forces of the particles present in the substances. Notice they underline certain terms because those are the things that they're looking for. They're actually highlighting to you what they want you to do. So let's state them one at a time. Explain the changes in state in experiment A in terms of energy changes. What are they really asking us for here? Basically, what they're saying is that the particles in experiment A in the different situations have energy, and we want you to tell us um, what those energies are. That's really what they're really saying. So if you look in the, um, the mixture here, what you're looking at is a solid mixture, okay? Homogeneous solid mixture, all right? And the energy of particles in solid is that they're weak. They, the particles in solids, they vibrate about a fixed position. And so the, part, the energy is low there in solids. But then when you apply heat to it, the particles gain energy and then they sublime. Okay, so they sublime. This is why you see the purple vapor inside the test tube. However, when they hit the surface of the watch glass now, which is going to be cold, they then lose energy and deposit on the on the surface of the wash glass, okay? And this is what your examiner is looking for. Notice you're telling about the change from solid to gas to solid again. That's what they're looking for, all right? So that would be in terms of the energy changes um, there. But let's look at the case of the intermolecular forces. So first of all, we started out with a solid. What's the strength of the intermolecular forces in a solid now? They're extremely high. That is why solids are so close together because those forces are very strong. They're high, strong forces, okay? Then when it sublimes and it changes into a gas, the forces have been weakened tremendously, okay? So right here now where you have the purple vapor, you would expect that those intermolecular forces are going to be weak. Then, as it moves up onto the watch glass now, they re-strengthen because you're now changing back from a gas to a solid in vapor deposition. And there you go. You get your three marks for that. You have spoken about the energy changes. You have spoken about the intermolecular forces. But that is just an experiment. Um, okay. What about experiment B? Same thing again. Look at the energy changes. 
okay? Energy changes. So first you have a solution, which salt is soluble in water, so it's going to be um, water, a liquid. How about the energy there? The particles have moderate amount of energy because it is a liquid, all right? So they're moving about a little, um, but not that great, okay? Then when the heat is applied, it boils. So now the particles have been converted from a liquid to a gas. They have a lot of energy now, a lot of kinetic energy. And so they move through the tube and go back down here. But down here, when they are subjected or they're exposed to the ice cold water and the ice, they lose, they lose energy. And so then they condense back to a liquid. Okay, so you have over here where they have moderate energy, they boil, get a lot of energy, move through the tube and come back down here with a condense and lose back energy. All right, so that would be the energy changes which occur there. Now let's look at the intermolecular forces. What happens to the intermolecular forces? Well, over here in the liquid, the intermolecular forces are moderate. They're moderate here. Then when you apply heat and it boils or evaporates, whichever one you choose to use at this point in time, then the forces become weak. The intermolecular forces become weak because you now have a gas and the gas travels through and then it comes back down here where it condenses. And so the intermolecular forces have been strengthened, pulling those particles closer together, changing the gas to a liquid. All right, so that is exactly what happens here in terms of intermolecular forces of attraction. So there you have, you get your six marks there once you mention and explain all of those things. Next on to B, it says iodine reacts with chlorine to form a brown liquid. They tell you the state of matter, iodine monochloride, ICL. What are you supposed to do? Write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction of um, for the formation of iodine monochloride include state symbols. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do right now. Okay. So first of all, iodine is actually a solid. So that's I2 and it's a solid. Okay. Put those state symbols in. Then now chlorine is a gas, Cl2. Hopefully it's very clear for you. Okay. And that produces I C L, which they did say was a liquid. So you put your L right there in your brackets. And of course, chlorine is a gas. So you put that in your bracket as well. Okay. Then now, as you can see, you then need to balance the equation. There are two iodines here, two chlorines over here, but only one there, one there. So all you need to do is put a two right there. Voila. There you go. You have your two marks. Okay. So let's go back and look again. All right, so there you have your two marks right there. Okay, so you have written your balance equation with your state symbols. You have satisfied all that they have asked you for. Okay, so the next part of the story now is that you need to use dot and cross diagrams, show the expected bonding in iodine monochloride. All right, so let us look at that as well at this point in time. Let me just clear up all these drawings. They ask you to use dot and cross diagrams. So really what they're asking you for is just for the electrons on the valence shell. All right, iodine and chlorine are in the same group. So they have seven valence electrons. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw the valence shell right there. Not drawn very nicely, but I hope you get the gist. And then I'm gonna put I right there and I'm gonna draw chlorine over here, which looks a little bit better, thankfully. And then you have your CL right there. So now you have seven valence electrons. I'll use X's for this one. One, two, right? Three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And then over here, I'll just use circles. Okay. So that's two. Yes. Four. Six seven all right don't mind how badly they're drawn it's not so nice drawn with these things but anyway um so you have seven valence electrons there are seven there so the type of bonding you expect to take place between two non-metals is of course covalent bonded 
So you expect to see something like this. You draw your circle around those electrons. And then, um, uh, let me see now. Then now you draw the product of that bond. So I'm, I'm trying to draw this as best as I can. I'm going to put I here because the iodine is actually bigger than the chlorine. That's the only reason why I'm putting I here, OK? Because the iodine is bigger than the chlorine. Then you have your X and your O. Yes, nice. And then your iodine or X is, so you put your six um, X's over here now. Okay. I'll just put two lines because drawing those X's seem to be a, a problem. All right, so there you go. Okay, there you go, there you have it. So this is the sort of bonding you're expected to show between iodine and chlorine. To the iodine bonds to chlorine. Remember that I put iodine on the right hand side because iodine is bigger than chlorine and I didn't want it to look a little bit skewed, okay? So there you go with that. That's two marks right there. You have done everything that the examiners asked you for. So that is two marks. Use dot and cross diagrams, show the expected bonding. Then it says now, suggest two properties of iodine monochloride based on the type of bonding indicated above. So let's think about this. Iodine has bonded to chlorine. It is a covalent bond. Therefore, it is a covalent species. However, there are two types of covalent species. You have simple covalent species and you have giant covalent species. Which one does this fall under? Then you need to think again and say, hmm, the giant covalent species that have been exposed to are diamond, graphite, um, fullerenes to some extent, and silicon dioxide, which is sand um, or silica, right? So iodine monochloride doesn't fall into that category. So it therefore must be a simple covalent um, species. Then you now ask yourself the question, what are the properties of simple covalent species? Well, there are a number of them. They have low melting point, low boiling point, usually liquids or gases at room temperature and pressure. They do not conduct electricity. They do not conduct heat. They, um, yeah, there's quite a bit of them, but I've given you a number there. So you can choose any of those two, low melting point, low boiling point at room temperature, usually liquids or gases. Um, so if you had to guess its state of matter, it's going to be either a liquid or a gas, all right? They don't conduct heat, they don't conduct electricity. Okay, and so therefore you would have satisfied this question now with respect to the two properties of the iodine monochloride. Now for the last part of the question, how does the bonding in ICL compare to that in chlorine or iodine? Give a reason for your answer, two marks. Again, not so bad. So you're thinking now what's similar between iodine monochloride and chlorine and iodine? or ID, here's the situation. All three of them are simple covalent molecules, okay? That's, that's the critical thing right here. All three of them are simple covalent molecules, therefore they will exhibit similar properties. And there you go. You have stated how they compare to each other and you have given a reason for your answer. Why um, do they have similar properties? Because they are simple covalent molecules. Okay? And that will give you your two marks. Okay, the, um, and that's it. Really, that is it. I hope this question, in answering this question, this helps you um, to appreciate how you should approach these questions when you are given them in your exam. Thank you guys for watching the video. Please like, share, subscribe, pass on the videos to your friends. Let them see what's going on. Let them realize that these things can be simplified for you when you check out G Squared Academy, where you know excellence is epitomized. All the best, and I'll see you guys next time.